What is the alternative? The alternative is automated uh, evaluation. And this is what we did in coursework one. And this is, believe it or not, what most search engines will do. They will run user studies occasionally when they roll out big things. But most of the tuning happens with automated evaluation. So the big idea of automated evaluation is try, you try to get the user out of the loop of the search engine completely. Uh, if you can manage to do that, you get some really big benefits. The main benefit is you can run evaluations as often as you like. Right? You write your algorithm and you decide to tweak your weighting scheme. Right? You change a number, you run evaluation, you get results. You change the number again, you run evaluation, you get results. You can do it a hundred times or a thousand times an hour if you wanted to. So, uh, now why is it important to tweak so much? That's because information retrieval is an interesting field, and you may have gotten a taste for this in, uh, in, uh, in, in coursework one and in coursework three as well. Um, so what makes it weird is what we think should work isn't really the same thing that works in the end of the day. Right? So in information retrieval, you think that things like phrases, you know, not, not doing the bag of words, concatenating words into bigger units, that should help, right? Because phrases carry meaning. It's a waste of time, it turns out. Right. WordNet, uh, identifying core terms, so terms that carry the most meaning in the query, all of these are things that intuitively should help, and, uh, and they don't. Much of linguistic processing, parsing, entity detection, relationship extraction, all of that seems very, very useful to extracting the meaning, and it's ultimately almost useless for information retrieval. Why? We have no idea. But what works are things that you wouldn't have guessed, right? Term weighting, how you put weights on the terms of your vector, that has much bigger effect than any kind of linguistic processing that you do. And in fact, most of linguistic things that you can come up with, you can mimic them by putting different term weightings on your terms. And that's, that's just bizarre, that's strange. But that works, right? Massive query expansion, pseudo-feedback in various forms. That works. Uh, using different regularization and network analysis, graph analysis tools, that seems to work really well. So why? Really unclear. Huh? <clears throat> if you have an automated evaluation setup, you can iterate through a large number of ideas very, very quickly. And that leads to, uh, that leads to being able to build really, really good systems by taking a crappy system and sort of interact iteratively making it better and better and better. And that has happened in a number of fields. So uh, in information retrieval, we'll talk about learning to rank. That's basically uh, take, taking that process to, uh, to the limit. And that's how most mo modern search engines rank results. It's not a single algorithm anymore. It's really just a huge combination of tweaks uh, that are found automatically by mining the logs and figuring out what works for particular settings. Uh, it has success stories in, in machine translation and speech recognition as well, right? So if you're familiar with those fields, both machine translation and speech recognition, they started out by using user-based evaluations, right? So for MT, you would, uh, you would take a sentence, have your machine, have your system translated into another language, and then users would assign scores to that. And that, of course, is slow. Uh, and then they invented, uh, then they invented Blue, which is an automatic uh, measure for, uh, for saying how good the translation is. And that has led to a, to a revolution in the field. The MT has exploded with the invention of Blue. So um, in a number of fields, as soon as you come up with a way to automate something, to, to automate the evaluation, uh, you see great gains made in a number of, in a number of years. <clears throat> so in information retrieval, this was actually set up a long time ago. And the name that it has, and this is somewhat arbitrary, but this is just the name that stuck, is the Cranfield paradigm. So Cranfield is not a guy. It's a place where these experiments were first run. And the basic idea of Cranfield paradigm is uh, for automated evaluation, you have three components. You have a set of topics. Right? These are the set of queries that you're going to submit to your system. And it's not just the query. A query is a small part of a topic. And I'll talk about what else, what else it has. Topics are really sort of information needs. What are the users looking for? And query is just a, a surface level expression uh, of that. Uh, then you have a set of documents. That's your corpus. right? That's what you're searching. And that has to be fixed. Um, and, and, and frozen in a way because, uh, you know, if I do my experiments on this set of documents and you do your experiments on a slightly different set tomorrow, we can't compare our results anymore. So it has to be exactly the same. 
And then you have a set of relevance judgments, and, and I'll talk about how, to, uh, how you come up with them. Relevance judgments are basically uh, indications of which documents are relevant, should be relevant to which query, which documents should be retrieved. So these three things together, they're known as a test collection. And then uh, you also need to pick uh, an effectiveness measure. And, and this is a measure that tells you how good, once, once your system has retrieved a set of documents for a query, how good is that retrieved set in relation to, um, to the relevant documents that you have uh, in your uh, relevance judgments. So let's talk about topics and corpora. So topics, they're really information needs. Uh, and uh, when you build a set of topics, you try to mimic realistic information needs. So this is where the task becomes important. The first thing you decide is who are going to be your users. Because if your users are doctors, they will issue one type of queries. If your users are general web users, anybody on the web, the type of queries that they issue is going to be vastly different from that. So you start by pinning down what are your users. Uh, <coughs> most of the topics in IR uh, they, uh, most of the topics in, in the evaluations that we're going to be talking about, they're constructed by professionals. So these are either analysts, people who listen to various uh, channels of information for various reasons. They could be patent officers, they could be medical, uh, medical researchers. So uh, they're usually professionals. Um, the corpora that are, that are typically used are news, um, uh, lots of scientific data. So you have professional data sets like legal, medical, patents. Um, uh, web pages are a lot harder to do because web pages, professional users typically don't search the web. They search a specific uh, subset of the web. So for the, coming up with a set of representative queries or topics for the web is pretty uh, challenging. Uh, you don't have to just do it for text, right? So uh, there, are, there are corporal and queries for speech, for images, for videos, for all of those. <coughs> um, and... Um, in information retrieval, there is actually a number of competitions that are run every year. So TREC, Text Retrieval Conference, that's the biggest one of those. It's been running for uh, many, many years. And every year it attracts a very large number of groups that are competing in various tasks. So a couple of years ago, they had about 117 participants. And by that, I mean 117 different industrial labs and university labs that each build their own search engine of type and they participate in track, and they basically compete against each other. Who's going to get the most? Uh, who's going to get the highest number? Um, uh, EU has their own um, version of track that's not nearly as active. And in Asia, you have NTCIR, which is quite active, quite active forum. So let's take let's take an uh, let's let's take a look at one of the topics. Right. So um, this is uh, this is a topic. Uh, this, this is from from the text retrieval conference. This is query number seven ninety four. The number is irrelevant, but uh, just, just for reference. So this is a topic. This is a definition of an information need. This is a definition of what somebody is trying to find, right? So uh, what they're trying to find is how are pets or animals used in therapy for humans and what are the benefits. So that is really the information need. That's what they're trying to find. Now, from that information need, you can generate different queries, right? And, and what is typically used as a query is... Uh, is given as a title, right? Pet therapy. So that would be the query that somebody would actually type into a search engine. So this is what they type in, and this is what they expect to find. And of course, the query is ambiguous, right? Pet therapy, uh, when I first read that, to me, pet therapy means is how do you, you know, how do you do therapy for your pets in some way? And of course, that's completely irrelevant to what the description is. This is about how do you use pets to do therapy on humans, right? <clears throat> So, so, uh, so there's a lot of ambiguity, uh, and that arises naturally whenever you try to condense something that long into, into a short uh, two-word query. But that's an example uh, of a topic. So this is really the information need, and that is the query that's generated from it. And you have competitions on different aspects of that, right? So you could just use the query, just the title, just a couple of keywords, or uh, sometimes you compete, you take the entire description. So you suppose that you have a system where somebody can type in something like that, or even the entire narrative, right? and then see how well you can do with that. <clears throat> so that's an example of a query. Uh, and these are, uh, these are just some examples of uh, commonly used uh, corpora in IR. So uh, communications of ACM, that's probably the oldest corpus. And that's actually the one that you used in coursework one. That's, uh, that's, that, that's what we had. So 
we have about uh, 3,000 documents, about two megs. Uh, they have relatively uh, relatively long queries, 13 words. That's that's unusual. <clears throat> um, most of the research nowadays, uh, you see it on, on collections like Gov2. So here you have about 25 million documents, a lot more queries. Queries are a lot shorter as well, so there are three words uh, long on average. Um, and I guess, uh, so here are some other big things that people play around with occasionally. Yeah. All right, so um, now we have, uh, we have the Cranfield paradigm, which is a way to automatically uh, evaluate a system. You also have the user study. So how do you compare them side by side? So a user study is interactive. The way it basically goes is you have a user sitting at a system that you've built. The user is going to put in the query. A system is going to produce a set of search results. And then the user is going to somehow interact with that system. So they'll scroll up and down, they'll, um, they'll look at individual items, maybe they'll tag them, maybe they'll copy and paste them with things between the items, maybe they will try to, to reformulate uh, the query in different ways. So there's a, there's a substantial interaction component. And as the user is doing that, the system will monitor everything and log things. So uh, look at mouse movement, look at clicking, look at uh, uh, the system may have an eye tracking component in which, it'll, in which case it'll log where the user is looking at on the page as opposed to where they're clicking. Um, uh, it will also have access to things like search history, so what have they searched for in the past and things like that. Right. <clears throat> and then the way you, you evaluate this interaction is by looking at the utility or the user's uh, satisfaction. So the utility is presumably they're doing the search session to solve some task, maybe give, maybe make a diagnosis in a, in a particular case. So have they done that successfully? How accurate were they? How many of your users accomplished the task and how long did it take them to accomplish that task? Right. And satisfaction is really, you know, did they find it easy to use? Was it nice? Did it have good eye candy and things like that? Um, so uh, in a Cranfield system, what you have is you have a fixed set of queries. So that's something that's predetermined at the beginning. You don't vary that. If you get, if you, you know, if you get 32 queries, that's how many queries you run. Uh, for each query, the system, autom uh, the system finds a set of relevant uh, results. So up until that point, everything is the same. Right? The system gets a set of results. Uh, and then what you need, instead of a user, is you need to know which of these documents the user would would like in a way, right? Which documents would be useful? And that's what's called R, the set of relevant documents. So this, this is a set of documents that are known to be useful for this particular information need, for this particular query. It's independent of the user, so that's a big abstraction right from the start, right? Different users would find different, yeah? I'm sorry? Who has, so the question is who has decided that they're useful? We're gonna talk about that on the next slide. Um, or maybe a couple slides down. So, uh, but you have this set that's frozen, and that says that these these are the documents that you want to retrieve. Uh, and then the evaluation boils down to evaluating how good is the set that you retrieved versus the set uh, of uh, versus the truth versus the gold standard, right? So, uh, how much of the relevant documents did we find? How much junk did we uh, return? Uh, and, and, and so on, right? Uh, you can simulate user interaction, but that's really a bit of a stretch, right? Anytime, anytime you try to simulate interaction based on R, you're basically inventing a strategy for how a real user would perform given uh, a certain output, right? So a common thing would be you get a ranking, and then you assume that the user is going to pick the top relevant document and use that for relevance feedback. Now, would the user really pick the top relevant document? You have no idea. What you're doing is you're making an assumption, you're making a model of how the user would perform in the situation and then trying to run with it. 